Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture 2012 by the Shaw Laureates in Astronomy 2012. Professor Jane Liu, Technical Staff of Lincoln Laboratory of Massachusetts <coughs> Institute of Technology in USA, and Professor David Jewett, Professor of Astronomy and Director of Institute for Planets and Exoplanets of University of California, Los Angeles in USA. May I first invite Professor Andrew C.F. Chen, head of Shaw College, to deliver the welcoming speech. Professor Chen, please. Uh, Professor David Jewett, Professor Jane Lu, distinguished guests, uh, fellow colleagues, students, Ladies and gentlemen, 10 years ago in 2002, the establishment of the Shaw Prize was announced in this auditorium. The Shaw Prize was established under the auspices of Sherman and Shaw in 2002 to honor individuals regardless of race, nationality, and religious belief who have achieved significant breakthrough in academic and scientific research or applications which have a positive and profound impact on mankind. The Shaw Prize is dedicated to facilitating society's progress, enhancing the quality of life and reaching humanity's spiritual civilization. It consists of three annual awards. First, astronomy. Second, life science and medicine. And third, mathematical sciences. This year, the prize in astronomy was awarded to Professor Jane Liu, technical staff of Lincoln Laboratory of MIT, and Professor David Jewett, professor of astronomy and director of Institute for Planets and Exoplanets. Don't ask me what's exoplanets. <laughs> Perhaps David and Jew might explain that in a, in a while. There might be something that's very, very far away, I think. <laughs> University at uh, UCLA, right? Today, we are honored to have invited Professor Jane Liu and also Professor David Jewett, the Shaw Prize Laureate in Astronomy of 2012, to deliver lectures on expanding the solar system. I understand that. But, and then the, the Cooper, <laughs> Cooper Belt <laughs> discovery. That's the tough part. Huh? We have to rely on you. <laughs> oh, not too tough, right? And secondly, the, the, the Cooper Belt what we know and we don't, respectively. We are so grateful that Professor Ji Mengzhong, Professor Ji, Professor in the Department of Physics, will introduce our Honorable Laureate and to moderate the question and answer sessions afterwards. Shaw College is fortunate to enjoy the privilege of hosting the Shaw Prize Lecture. To us, this has a special meaning, not only because the Shaw Prize and Shaw College have the common benefactor, but also because we are exceptionally delighted to be here to witness the significance of the scientific advancement of mankind. We are grateful to Sir Run Run for his generosity and particular concern for youth education, which make the formation of Shaw College at CUHK possible. Furthermore, we have the highest respect for his passion and also commitment to the promotion of scientific advancement that make the establishment of the Shaw Prize feasible. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Now, may I invite the facilitator of the lecture today, Professor Chu Meng Chong, Professor of the Department of Physics of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to introduce Professor Liu and Professor Jewett. <laughs> Professor David Jewett, Professor Jane Liu, Professor Chen Ning Yang, Professor Benjamin Hua, Professor Andrew Chen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to be here and introduce the Shaw Laureates in Astronomy 2012, Professor Jane Liu and Professor David Jewett to you. Professor Jane Liu was born in Saigon, Vietnam. 
She received her bachelor's degree in physics from Stanford University in 1984, and PhD in planetary astronomy from MIT in 1990. From 1990 to 1994, she was a postdoctoral fellow at various institutions, namely the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. She was appointed assistant professor at Harvard University in 1994, and professor at Leiden University of the Netherlands in 1998. Since 2001, Professor Liu has been a member of the technical staff at Lincoln Lab, MIT. The asteroid 5430, Liu, is named in her honor. Professor Jewett was born in England. He graduated from the University of London in 1979 received a master's degree in science and a PhD in planetary science and astronomy from Caltech in 1980 and 1983, respectively. In fact, I also received my bachelor's degree from Caltech in 1983, so we were in the same graduation ceremony. <laughs> but I didn't know you that time. <laughs> so from 1983 to 1988, he was an assistant professor at MIT. And from 1988 to 1993, he held positions as associate astronomer and associate professor at the University of Hawaii, where he later became astronomer and professor in 1993. Since 2009, he has become a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, and he's also the director of the Institute for Planets and Exoplanets at UCLA. The Shaw Prize in Astronomy is awarded to Professor Jewett and Professor Liu uh, for the discovery and characterization of trans-Neptunian bodies, which is actually a much better name than uh, what's probably more popularly known as the Kuiper Belt objects. And I'm sure Professor Jewett will explain that in his talk. These are very small bodies with orbits beyond that of Neptune. And they are believed to preserve a lot of information about early solar system. So this belt contains all these objects that are archaeological treasure, allowing us to study how the solar system was formed, what it was like in its early days. I spent a whole afternoon on Sunday with Professor Jewett and Professor Liu. And I was especially impressed by the fact that the project looking for these small bodies out there was started actually by a very simple question. The question is, how come the solar system seems to be so empty beyond the orbit of Neptune? Or actually, one should even ask another question first. Is it really that empty? That's how it all started. Um, and so Professor Jewett and Professor Liu spent five years looking for these tiny objects. They didn't even know how many there were. There may be nothing there. They, don't, they didn't know how large these bodies are. Um, but they spent five years. And during some of those periods, they did not even get a grant to support their research but they persisted. And after five years of hard work, they finally found the first Kuiper Belt object. And that transformed the field of solar system physics. We now know a lot more about the formation and the early dynamics of the solar system. Without further ado, may I now invite Professor Jane Liu to speak to us on expanding the solar system, the Kuiper Belt discovery which will give us some useful background for the talk by Professor David Jewett, which is on the details and implications of the discovery of the Kuiper Belt. Let's welcome Professor Liu.
In the early 1990s, astronomers thought they knew everything that was in, in the solar system. The planets, the satellites, the asteroids, the meteorite, the comet, everything could fit on, on this slide. Basically, the planetary system, they thought, effectively ended at around the orbit of Neptune or, or Pluto, depending on what you thought of Pluto. So they thought the, invent the, inventory, of the in uh, inventory of the solar s system uh, was complete. So in fact, if you talk to the average astronomer, he or she would have questioned why you bothered to study the solar system at all, since everything was known already. But the discovery of the Kuiper Belt in 1992 turned this view upside down and showed us that we were very far from understanding our own solar system. The discoveries also prompted a huge debate about Pluto, ultimately leading to its demotion and the dis disappointment of children worldwide. And my talk today is about how, how the whole thing unfolded. The widely accepted theory of planet formation was that everything in the solar system formed from uh, a disk of dust and gas called the, the solar nebula. This nebula itself is a remnant from the, the cloud. Um, that gave rise to the sun in the first place. The gas in the nebula, nebula was very tenuous, composing mostly of hydrogen and helium. Fine dust grains were everywhere. And these grains orbited around the sun, they collided with each other, they stuck together, and they slowly grew bigger and bigger until they formed planets. As early as 1949, uh, an Irish a science, scientist um, named Kenneth Edgeworth, he speculated that since the solar nebula was unlikely to have a sharp edge at the orbit of Neptune or Pluto, um, there might still be a swarm of small icy bodies uh, beyond Neptune. And this idea was brought up again by Gerard Kuiper in 1951. These objects beyond Neptune, if they existed, would not be planet-sized because it took too long for, um, for, for large bodies to grow at such large distances. So they would be smaller, perhaps comet-sized. So the region beyond the planets would be filled with these leftover bodies that never grew into planets. But Kuiper erroneously thought that Pluto was a massive body and having such a massive body nearby, um, it would have scattered away this, this trans-Neptunian uh, population. So he thought that it may be the, the, the swarm of comets existed, but then it's been cleared out by now by, by, by Pluto. Edgeworth, more correctly, suggests that these remnant bodies um, would still be there and could be observed if they um, were to enter the inner solar system. For both Edgeworth and Kuiper, these speculations were not based on any calculation or any model. They were little more than educated guesses. So the speculations went largely unnoticed by the astronomy community. community. Um, but every so often, this idea of a trans-Neptunian comet belt would be revived in connection to one particular problem. And that problem is, where do comets come from? And to appreciate this problem, I'll give you a quick summary of, uh, of comets. Comets are small icy bodies orbiting the sun, and we identify them by their coma which is a large cloud of dust and gas that, that surrounds the nucleus. The coma appears when a, coma, a comet approaches the sun, gets heated, that's heated enough so that ice in, in, in um, the comet uh, evaporate. As this, these newly released gas molecules escape uh, from, from the, the, the nucleus, and they would contain ices like water, <coughs> methane, ammonia. As these uh, gas molecules escape from the nucleus, they eject dust particles, so filling the coma uh, with dust and gas. And these dust particles inside the coma reflect sunlight, and that's how we can see uh, the comet. If you turn off the coma, and you would see the nucleus, like the, um, the, 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 slide, the picture on the uh, upper right, which looks kind of like a, like a dirt ball. The presence of the coma tells us immediately two things. One, that the comet is full of ice, the astronomer Fred Whipple actually calls them dirty snowballs. So this means that it spends most of its life uh, far away from the sun, where it's, where it's cold. And two, the, the existence of the coma tells us that the comet is constantly losing mass. The dust particles and the gas molecules in the coma are, are not bound to the nucleus anymore. They, they have been ejected from the nucleus and they're lost into space. So with every orbit, um, each time a comet is heated by the sun, it loses more mass. A typical five kilometer nucleus, like, like Comet Halley, would have a mass of about 10 to the 15 kilogram. When it's near the sun, it loses mass at the rate of about 10 tons per, per, per second. And at this rate, um, it would, uh, would lose all its mass in about uh, 1,000 orbits. It's true that the comet doesn't lose uh, mass at this high rate 
all around its orbit. It only happens when it's near the sun. So it might be able to survive for longer than a thousand, a thousand years, but it is very, very unlikely that this is, it's just simply unable to sustain this kind of mass loss for the, the four billion years age of the solar system. Furthermore, the active comets are also under the gravitational control of the planets. And it's likely that a comet would um, end its life by, e by being either ejected by, uh, from the solar system uh, by hitting the sun or um, absorbed by an impact with a planet like comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy, as you can see in the lower uh, images. So this happens on the time scale about half a million years. So given that the average comet meets an end uh, one way or the other and in at most half a million years, so why do we still see so many comets? Are new comets being made all the time? Well, uh, well we, don't, we, do, we do not know of any place where this can happen. So we have to come to the conclusion that comets were formed a long time ago with the rest of the solar system, and they have been stored since their formation in a very cold place. So the question is, where is this comet reservoir? The question is complicated by the fact that comet orbits are not all alike. There are some large orbits, there's small orbits. So astronomers roughly divided the comets into uh, two groups. They're the long period comets. These are the ones that take longer than 200 years to go around the sun, and the short period comets. Um, these are the ones that take less than 200 years around the sun. So um, this slide shows two pictures uh, of the, the orbits of the, the long period comets. The one on the left just shows a, a bigger view of uh, um, the long period comet orbits, and you can see that they're randomly oriented. They can come in from any direction. And the right figure is just the same orbits, but, but zoomed in. Um, so, as, as you can see, they're randomly oriented. Half of them come uh, uh, are on um, orbit the sun clockwise. The other, another, other, the other half goes around counterclockwise, and the orbits are also very large, extending as far about 50,000 astronomical <coughs> units. One astronomical unit is a distance between the Earth and the sun, and we usually call it at one AU uh, for short. So these comet orbits extend as, um, as far out as so 50,000 uh, AU further than uh, the Earth. In contrast, the, uh, the short period comet orbits um, okay, I'm confused. Um, take less than 200 years to go around the sun. They can be seen every uh, few years, and that's the figure on the right. Um, so the two circles you see in the figure on the right are the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, so you can see the, com the short period comet orbits are clustered inside the inner solar system, mostly inside the, the orbit of Jupiter. And they also form a flat disk in, in the plane of the planets, also called the ecliptic plane. So it's clear that the short period comets have orbits very different than long period comets, as you can see by comparing the, the two uh, figures. So where do these comets come from? Um, for the long period comets, that question had been, has been answered since 1950 by Jan Oort, a, a Dutch astronomer. Just from absorbing the orbits of long period comets, um, he deduced that, be, that being, having such large orbits, they must have come from a spherical cloud very, very far away with a diameter of about 50,000 AU. And this cloud should contain about 7 billion individual comets, and it's now called the Oort cloud. And this is the acknowledged reservoir of the long period comets. Now, being at such large distances from the sun, the Oort cloud is um, almost halfway out to the nearest star. So the sun's gravity is very tenuous at this distance, and um, the Oort cloud is very susceptible to gravitational influence of passing stars and, and the galaxy. And um, so passing stars over time have stirred up the, the Oort cloud, and that's why um, um, they're giving it a spherical shape, and that's thus explaining the random orientation of the long period comets. And these passing stars also deflect the comet orbits uh, slowly so that eventually some of them make their way into the inner solar system where we can discover them, and then some of them also get ejected uh, from um, the solar system altogether. So those astronomers had a good handle on where the long period comets come from, but that was not the case with the short period comets. People didn't know where they came from, so people hypothesized that, oh, maybe they used to be long period comets, and then somehow they got captured into short, short period orbits, probably by, by Jupiter. Um, but they had no way of, of, uh, of, of, of proving this, and, and so the, mis the, the origin of the short period comets uh, remained a mystery. And um, also, but, but as people look into this problem further, they found that it had a lot of problems. So um, the several theorists, like the one mentioned, uh, the pointed out on, on the slide, they would revive the idea of trans-Neptunian comet belt, say, proposing that this might be a better source for the short period comets. So, so that was the way things stood uh, in 1987. Um, around 1986, 1987, Dave Jewett, who, who uh, at the time was my advisor at MIT, he began to wonder why the, um, 
the outer region of the solar system seems so empty. The inner solar system contains a lot of stuff. There's the planets, there's the asteroid belt. Um, but the region from Jupiter outwards was pretty empty. It only contained a few planets, and then maybe uh, Pluto and a few strange bodies that we didn't uh, know the origin of. Um, so it, it seemed it, the, there was a strong contrast between the inner and outer solar system. And as he saw it, there could be um, two reasonable explanations why the outer solar system was so uh, empty. First, it could be empty because of the, the, the giant planets. Um, these planets are so good at ejecting everything near them that maybe they had cleared out everything uh, that was nearby. And so that would explain, that would make um, um, the outer solar system empty. Unfortunately, the computers of the 1980s were, um, were not fast enough to confirm the stability of orbits in the outer solar system. So we don't know if this hypothesis is, is a correct one, but so we had to consider that. Well, second, the emptiness would just be an artifact of uh, the vast distances to, to the outer solar system. We see solar system bodies by reflected sunlight. So if you take a solar system object for at one uh, uh, AU and you move it out to 10 AU, it becomes dimmer and it becomes dimmer very quickly. Going from one AU to 10 AU, it doesn't become dimmer by a factor of 10, but it could become dimmer by a factor of 10,000. So you can see that brightness of solar system objects decrease so quickly with distance that it, would, it seemed uh, very reasonable that maybe objects did exist further out. Um, but they were so faint that they just escaped detection. And they was used to, to looking at faint objects. In 1982, while still a grad student at Caltech, he used one of the first CCD cameras um, on the Palomar 200 inch to recover the, the return of Comet Halley. At the time, Comet Halley was uh, still four years beyond perihelion. It was beyond Saturn, it was very faint, um, and with a magnitude of 24. So they recovered the Comet Halley, and he figured that if he could see uh, something as small as a nucleus of Comet Halley, about five kilometers beyond Saturn, maybe he could see other things um, at that kind of distance, or maybe even further than the, the planets. Um, so in 1987, I, I just started graduate school at MIT, and I was looking for a project to work on, and Dave told me idea of this, uh, this idea of looking for things beyond the, the, um, the planets. And I had, you know, being a gra stupid graduate student, I had no idea how hard it was going to be, uh, so I, I just went along. But how were we going to find distant things? Well, at first, we thought the best way might be through occultation. Um, in an occultation event, uh, a solar system body goes in front of a, a background star, and then it dims the, the light from the star for very briefly. So if you monitor uh, a distance, a, a star in an occultation, you would see lines like the one uh, shown on the slide. So you see that the brightness would be constant, and then um, it would be dim for a very brief period when, and when the object passes in front of the star. So we would be looking for these brief periods when the star is dimmed to indicate uh, the existence of, of, of distant objects. But the, the whippoorwills of Arizona quickly put an end to, to our occultation strategy. Whippoorwills are nocturnal birds. Um, they're common in Arizona. And uh, there's a picture of them on, on, on the left. The coloring makes them hard to see, but um, they, they, so that you don't see them during the daytime. But uh, they're, they're nocturnal birds, so they're very active at night, and they're also very loud. So I can try to let you hear. <laughs> so this is what they sound like. Um, we were observing at Kitt Peak, Arizona at the time, and uh, a disappointing phone call to the Arizona Audubon Society revealed that the occultations were not going to work. They would be too frequent, there were a lot of these birds, um, and so they would mimic uh, the real occultation uh, by, by any distant object. So we had to come up with a new plan. We had no prediction what we were looking for, so we decided to use two methods for our search. First, we would use photograph, we use um, uh, we would photograph large areas of the sky using photographic plates, which meant telescopes. Photographic plates are what astronomers used to use before electronic det detectors became available. They were simply glass plates covered with a, 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 a light-sensitive coating, and you simply expose a plate to um, the night sky to make a photograph of the sky. Then you develop it just like you would uh, with film negatives. And here's an image that the one the figure to the right is an image uh, from, from a photographic plate. It's huge. It shows the entire uh, Sagittarius uh, constellation. Um, in addition to using photographic plates, we would also use CCD camera on a 1.3 meter telescope to find much fainter things. 
with a limiting magnitude about 24. And on the left is a figure of a typical CCD image. You can see that the CCD image covers a much smaller uh, area of the sky, but it also gives you much better resolution, uh, so better sensitivity. So with these two methods, we thought we would cover everything. To show you how photographic plates are analyzed, uh, look, the figure on the left um, is uh, the 19th century version of a computer room. This is uh, the Harvard Observatory in um, 1891, where women were used <laughs> to examine glass photo uh, photographic plates containing image images of the sky, looking for changes in the stars. And you can imagine how painful that was. Um, you have to look at every single star on, on, on the plates. The only good thing about photographic plates is that they're very big. They can cover a, a very big area of the sky in one shot. The plates we use covered um, 25 square degree uh, in one go, and that's a size of about 100 full moons, which is a pretty big area. In contrast, CCDs are much smaller, and the figure on the right shows you a typical CCD. It's about a thousand times smaller than a photographic plate, but it's also a hundred times uh, more sensitive. And by using both plates and CCDs, we thought we could target both uh, the rare uh, bright object, and we could also target the, the more abundant faint objects, so we thought we would cover everything. We would also distinguish objects from uh, slow moving object, nearby object from distant object by, by how fast they were moving because distant object would, be, would move slower than, than nearby objects. So based on this speed limitation, we called our project the slow moving, slow moving object survey. Um, every sky survey is now done with CCDs because astronomers now have access to very large CCDs like the one shown in this slide. Um, this particular CCD camera has a 1.4 billion pixels in this uh, CCD camera for the PanStar telescope. Um, in, co in, in contrast, the one we use was about the size of that red dot. Okay. <laughs> so, so the idea with, of surveying the sky with a small camera uh, was a, a pretty radical idea. <coughs> Um, well, I remember asking Dave, isn't it crazy to, to, to do a large survey of the sky with a CCD? And his answer was, if we didn't do it, who will? So, so we went ahead with that. Well, whether with uh, photographic plates or CCD images, the, the way you find moving things in, in the solar system is the same. You take, a, you, look, you take a sequence of images and you look at them very rapidly so that stationary things like stars and galaxy would, would appear constant where anything that moved would jump from one spot to, to the other. And this process is called blinking. And this is a traditional way to find solar system objects. To analyze photographic plates, we would uh, return to Kid Peak to use a machine called the, the plate comparator, which is a machine that allows us to switch back and forth between uh, two photographic plates very, uh, very quickly. And then so we would uh, locate things that jump that way. And the two top slides show the discovery plates um, for, for, for Pluto. And that's how the, the, the red arrows show how Pluto moved um, between uh, the two plates. And so that's what we did with our photographic plates. Um, and so it, you, as you can imagine, it took hours and hours and hours to stare at every, every dot uh, to see if anything moved. And the whole ordeal was so painful that after completing the first part of, uh, of our survey, we decided to use only CCDs from now on, no more photographic plates. Uh, in, in contrast, blinking with CCD images is a lot easier. At the bottom, you can see um, a sequence of CCD images showing a Kuiper Belt object moving. So you can see this is a lot easier. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when when we well, when we started our first started our survey, we, we were just unaware of, of the, 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 the works that I mentioned uh, earlier of, on the Trans-Neptunian Comet Belt. Even after we became aware of these works, they had little impact on our survey because they made no testable predictions. There was no prediction as to how many of these things there might be, how big they might be, so, or where they might be located. Um, so the, these work didn't have any impact on, on, on our, our survey, and we just carried on doing the, 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 the plan that we had. In 1988, uh, Dave moved to the University of Hawaii, um, and I followed him there, so, and, we care, um, and we continue our slow-moving object survey. And these slides show um, the top of Mauna Kea. This is where we did our observing from then on. Uh, Mauna Kea is a, a shield volcano, and in the lower left figure shows uh, Mauna Kea with snow on the summit, and that's why the, where the name Mauna Kea comes from. It means a, a white mountain. So on to the top of Mauna Kea, there's about a, a dozen telescopes, and uh, the telescope that we use uh, for our work, most of our work was uh, the 88 inch, the 2.2 meter telescope belonging to the University of Hawaii. 
Um, so from, from now we have a, access to a 2.2 meter telescope, which was bigger than what we had before. And we also know that our 2.2 meter telescope on Mauna Kea was as good as a, a four meter telescope elsewhere because of the excellent uh, conditions, observing conditions on Mauna Kea. Uh, for those of you who think that the life of an astronomer is, is glamorous, and here's, here's a more accurate presentation of uh, our life, uh, many long cold nights in a control room on top uh, of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. Because of this altitude, Mauna Kea, which is, uh, the altitude is 14,000 feet, about uh, 4,200 meters, um, and being in the middle of the, the ocean, the air above Mauna Kea is uh, exceptionally stable and it's dry, making it a wonderful place for uh, observing, but a miserable place uh, for humans. The oxygen level at the summit was about 40% lower than the oxygen level uh, at sea level. And so besides being oxygen deprived, uh, become more, becoming more and more dehydrated, um, there was a lot of sitting around and waiting. There was waiting for the, the weather to clear up. The left uh, photo shows you uh, Mauna Kea in the winter time. We do, we, did get a, we do get a lot of snow blizzards and you just sit there and wait for the, the weather to clear up. And there you can see on the right, there's also waiting around for the telescope operator to wake up. And uh, so we were glad to have access to Mauna Kea, but uh, we were also very happy to leave the mountain at the end of each uh, observing run. Um, our search was not popular. Telescope time committees and funding agencies did not, did not look favorably on, 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 on searches for objects that uh, were not predicted by any theory and that might not exist. Our friends and colleagues often asked us when we were going to quit, and usually we just answered, soon, soon we'll quit. Uh, and we, we got telescope time for our search any way we could, uh, mostly by, by stealing from, from other projects. Um, we would write telescope proposals, uh, say, proposing work, uh, other projects, and then we would use, steal some of that time for, for, for the, our survey. And this went on for years. Uh, in the meantime, CCDs got, kept getting bigger, and which kept up, uh, our, we, often we wanted to quit, but you know, usually, when we wanted to quit, a bigger CCD would come along, and then we would think, oh, with this CCD, we're going to find something. So that kept us going. Um, in late summer of 1992, there was a new camera on, on the telescope, and this camera had 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. It was just 20 more times than, than our first CCD. And the first time we went observing with this uh, camera, we succeeded in, in finding a Kuiper Belt object. It was on August 30th, 1992, almost exactly 20 years ago, and um, the slide shows the four discovery images, and the time of the observations are also indicated. So the strategy was that we would take four images of the same spot in the sky, separated over a few hours, and we needed at least three or four images um, to confirm any detection because there were a lot of artifacts that could mimic a real slow-moving object, like, like cosmic rays. So we had taken the first two of the sequence, and um, we were waiting for the third image to, to be finished, and Dave was blinking the first two images. Um, I, I did not like blinking with, with just two images because there was too many false alarms, but, but, like, but Dave liked doing it. So Im immediately, a candidate caught his eye. The candidate had uh, all the right characteristics. It was moving slowly, and it was moving in the right direction, west and, and south. It was faint enough that it was unlikely anybody had seen it before, um, uh, but it was also bright enough that we knew that it was not noise in the image. But it could have still, it could have been almost anything. Um, and you know, after so many years of searching, we, 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 we hardly believed that, that you know, this, this could be real, which is simply too good to be true. And then the third image came out and the object was still there. It was still moving in that right direction, um, moving at the right speed. And then the fourth image came out and still the same. The object was still there and still doing the same thing. And then that was when we, re uh, we realized that it was um, a real object. So by the end of the night, we, we knew that we had found a solar system object beyond Neptune, about 41 AU, um, more distant than anything uh, that anybody's seen before. Based on the object speed, we could calculate that it was about, about 41 AU. Um, and based on its brightness, we calculated it was about 250 kilometers in diameter. We knew we had covered about 0.7 square degree before finding this first object. So from that, we could calculate that, well, if these objects lived in a belt, 
uh, in the plane of the solar system, we could calculate how many objects were still out there. And the answer was many, thousands were waiting uh, discovery. And this object came to be known as 1992 QB1 um, from the order in which it was uh, discovered in 1992. So the trans-Neptunian population to which it uh, belonged is now called the Kuiper Belt, even though Kuiper anti-predicted it. A lot of people were skeptical uh, about our discovery. Brian, this is Brian Marston. He, uh, then he was a director of the uh, IAU Minor Planet Center, and he made a $500 bet with us that uh, QB1 was mostly a, a long-period comet, and with a size of 250 kilometers, it was going to be the comet of the century. And he subsequently lost his bet, and he paid up. <laughs> um, other people told us that we were just lucky. 1992 QB1 was the only object of its kind in the entire solar system, and we were just lucky to find it, and there wouldn't be any other one. And this was very silly, because we didn't think we were so special. And uh, also because simple statistics told us otherwise. If you could find an object in a very, very small part of the sky, um, it has to be that uh, there must be many more of it. If you look in a, a bigger area. Basically, we had broken through a, a, a psychological barrier. We, we knew how to find the first one, and from then on, we, from then on, we knew we could find more. And it, it, it was true. Six months later, on the next observing run, we found the second object. So by now, about 1,500 Kuiper Belt objects have been found by many groups all over the world. We now know that it's a donut shape, ring of icy bodies. Um, shown in this slide. The thickness is about 25 to 30 degrees. It, uh, it extends from just between, be beyond Neptune's orbit to about 1,000 AU. The population contains about 70,000 objects larger than 100 kilometers. And then if you go down to uh, one kilometer, there were many, many more, about maybe uh, hundreds of million objects. Many Pluto-sized objects have been discovered. Um, altogether, the mass in the current Kuiper belt is about 0.1 Earth mass. This is much larger than the mass of the asteroid belt, but still is too small to form big bodies like, like Pluto on a reasonable time scale. So this evidence, plus other evidences that you will hear later on, point to a much, much more massive uh, original Kuiper belt. The original Kuiper belt must have contained about on the order of 10 Earth masses. So the current Kuiper belt, Kuiper belt is a very, very small version, of, uh, a, a, a small thinner version of what used to be there. A direct consequence of the Kuiper Belt's thickness is how fast these things collide with each other. These objects collide with each other at the speed with a relative velocity about 1, 1 1.5 kilometers per second. And with this kind of speed, all impacts let, lead to shattering. Things don't stick and grow bigger the way that they used to. Um, so, so objects shatter uh, and, and form dust when they, they, when they uh, collide. So here's another evidence that the primordial Kuiper Belt must have been much different from what it is now. The original Kuiper Belt must have much gentler collisions in order to make big things. So, so this, this is just another evidence that our current Kuiper Belt is very different from what it used to be. Um, so, okay, so we found a new population beyond uh, uh, Neptune. So what if we hadn't found anything? Oh, well, we would have been disappointed. Um, but our efforts would not have been a complete waste of time because of the original goal of our survey was not to find the Kuiper Belt. Um, it was simply to really verify whether the solar, outer solar system was as empty as it seemed. And this is an important point because we had no preconception of what um, we were going to find. If there were things to be found in the outer solar system, great. If, we, if there was nothing to be found, this answer would have been also useful to know. But it's always more fun uh, to, to find something rather than nothing, not to mention to, to receive uh, receiving awards like the Shaw Prize. Um, the Kuiper Belt yielded many surprises, and these will be discussed in more detail by, by Dave. But I'll just report on one particular finding that was probably the most influential in uh, demoting uh, Pluto. So this figure is a plot from one of our, our early papers, um, written only about four years after the first discovery. At that time, we had discovered only about 30 Kuiper Belt objects, and they're plotted here. Semi-major axis versus eccentricity. The semi-major axis tells you how big, how large, how, uh, how distant the object is, and uh, the eccentricity tells you how elliptical the orbit is. Um, so it was already clear with just 30 objects that the Kuiper Belt object were not distributed evenly uh, uh, throughout the belt. The plot did not show a uniformly, uh, a uniformly distributed uh, uh, population. Instead, you find gaps um, and, and, and um, uh, concentration of bodies, as right, you can see in, in the plot. So this points to the fact that, so, that the belt has been sculpted 
by the gravitational influence of the giant planets, most, mostly uh, Neptune. So these brackets that are marked uh, in, in the plot are called um, resonances, and, and their names are indicated on the top, like the 5 to 4 resonance, 3 to 2, and 5 to 3 resonances. A Pluto is marked by a red X, okay? And you can see that if I, Pluto blends in perfectly with the other object in that resonance, if I didn't mark Pluto with an X, you wouldn't have been too able to pick it out. Resonant objects have a special dynamical relationship with, with Neptune. For example, Pluto's in a 3 to 2 resonance. This means that Pluto completes two orbits around the Sun for every three orbits that Neptune completes around the Sun. And similarly, so the 2 to 1 resonance, for example, would have uh, the objects there would make one orbit around uh, uh, the Sun for every two orbits completed by Neptune. So these are very precise mathematical configurations and they have special consequences. If you take Pluto for, uh, for example, you know that the orbit of Pluto crosses the orbit of Neptune, but the two never collide. And uh, because that's because the resonance dynamics make sure uh, uh, that, that this, um, they never collide. So Pluto is protected from uh, close encounters with the planet, and the same protection applies to the other objects in the same two, in the three to two resonance. And these objects are called Plutinos to emphasize their uh, similarity with Pluto. The estimated number of Plutinos is about larger than 100 kilometers, is, is several tens of thousands. In my opinion, um, this plot, more than any argument about size, proves very clearly is that um, that Pluto is more accurately viewed as a Kuiper Belt object. And once we discovered Pluto, the uproar over Pluto began. The history of how Pluto came to be labeled the ninth planet is, is well known. Astronomers in the, in the um, early 20th century noted that, Ur the, that Uranus' position deviated from prediction. So since these de deviations could not be att attributed to, to Neptune, they suppose that maybe they must be due to um, an unseen massive planet. And uh, Percival Lowell, the guy on the left, um, he called this unseen disturber uh, of, plan of Uranus, Planet X. He calculated where it should be. He started a search to find it. He hired Clyde Tombaugh, that's the picture on the right, to, to, um, to do the search. In 1930, Tombaugh found Pluto near the predicted position, he, and he announced the discovery of the new planet. But immediately, almost immediately, people noticed there were many things wrong with this new planet. Well, after Pluto was found, astronomers, astronomers went back to their old data, and they found that they, were, they, they had recorded it on old photographic plates as early as 1914. They de determined its orbit, and it clearly indicated that, that this new planet was very different from all the other planets. Whereas the other planets had nearly circular orbits, Pluto's orbit was highly elliptical, as you can see in this plot. Whereas the other planet's orbit lay mostly in a, the ecliptic plane, Pluto's orbit uh, was highly tilted out of the plane, 16 degrees. It even crossed the orbit of Neptune, which is very bizarre behavior for a planet. Even Tom Bow suspected that his new planet was not what he was looking for originally. And then eventually we found that uh, Pluto was much smaller uh, than, than too small to perturb uh, other planets. Its mass is only 0.2% of the Earth mass, even smaller than the moon. So Pluto had nothing to do with Uranus uh, orbit. And so then eventually people eventually found that Uranus position, um, the, the, its position really didn't really deviate from any prediction. It was, this deviation was, uh, was all wrong. It was due to observational errors. So the, all the predictions of Pluto were completely wrong. And Tom Bao found Pluto not because of any prediction, but because he was looking when nobody else was. Uh, Pluto, as I mentioned earlier, Pluto was recorded as early as 1914, two decades before Tom Bao found it. And, but that's only because nobody was looking for a planet at the time. And the story of missed discovery is not new. Um, Neptune was discovered, uh, was recorded by Galileo, but uh, he didn't pay it any attention, so he delayed his discovery by 200 years. And similarly, many of the bright Kuiper Belt objects have been recorded in the 50s and 60s, uh, but since everybody was on, thought Pluto was the last planet, nobody paid any attention to these things, so they didn't notice the bright Kuiper Belt objects until we established the uh, belt in 19, 1990s. Um, so when, when Pluto's planethood became shaky, there was a huge public outcry against the demotion of, of Pluto. Some people felt betrayed. For all, they thought, well, for a long time, astronomers thought, taught them that Pluto was a planet, and now we tell them that it's not a planet. So why should they believe astronomers now? Well, the obvious answer is, is it's the nature of science uh, to change. For scientific progress to happen, scientists have to tear down old ideas and, and replace them with new ideas that fit the observations better. 
many people, uh, including astronomers, said that uh, demoting Pluto would be disrespectful to Tom Bao, to the public, uh, especially children, since kids like Pluto. We don't want to hurt people's feelings, especially children's. Um, but the point here is that science does not depend on the public's feelings, not even children's. Um, and finally, some people say that it does not matter what the label is. We should simply keep calling Pluto a planet just to avoid confusion. But labels do matter because they affect people's behavior. Um, people simply do not see things that, uh, that, that um, they're not looking for. Galileo missed Neptune because he wasn't looking for it. Astronomers miss Pluto and Kuiper Bell objects because they, they were hung up on Pluto being the last planet. So if they were not misled by this label, then maybe the Kuiper Belt would have been discovered long ago. So to sum it up, Pluto was misclassified as a planet. It's a large but otherwise unremarkable Kuiper Belt object. Its origin lies in the Kuiper Belt. Its properties are best understood in the context of the Kuiper Belt. So here's a quick summary of what I, I talked about so far. So just beyond uh, uh, Neptune, you have the Kuiper Belt extending out to about 1,000 AU. Then we don't know what happens beyond that. And then you go f much further out to about 50,000 AU, you have the Oort cloud. So the area between 1,000 and about 50,000 AU, well, right now, we, have, we, we don't know what lies, in, in, lies in, in that region. So there has been a lot of discussion regarding uh, Pluto's place in the Kuiper Belt, but not much attention has been paid to another outer si solar system body that also has a, an origin in, in, in Kuiper Belt. This is a Neptunian cell like Triton. Uh, Triton is slightly larger than Pluto. It kind of has a similar density as Pluto's and also has a similar composition as Pluto, nitrogen, water, ice, and carbon dioxide. Uh, most importantly, it orbits Neptune in a retrograde orbit. That means um, it goes in the opposite direction as the, the spin of, the, of Neptune. So this retrograde orbit means that it could not have formed uh, as an original satellite of Neptune, but it must have been captured from somewhere. Given its similarity with, uh, with Pluto and given its proximity to the Kuiper Belt, it's quite likely that Triton uh, also came from the Kuiper Belt. Well, several models have been proposed to explain the origin of Triton, and the problem they all had to solve was how to slow down Triton, Triton slow it down enough for it to be captured. A recent model by uh, uh, Agnew and, and Hamilton uh, suggests that um, Triton was part of a binary system that came too close to Neptune. So during this close encounter, some of Triton's, Triton's orbital energy were transferred to its uh, companion, which escaped, while leaving behind captured Triton. The appeal of this theory is that it's supported by yet um, another surprise from the Kuiper Belt the prevalence of binary systems inside the Kuiper Belt. A few dozen binary systems have been discovered already, and it's estimated up to about 15 to 20 percent of the Kuiper Belt consists of binary systems. And again, in order to, cre to create this many uh, uh, binary systems, the original Kuiper Belt must have been uh, much more massive than it is now. Okay, so just here's the last point. Um, this plot shows some representative orbits from the, 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 the Kuiper Belt. The scale is in AU. Um, there are different colors to indicate different uh, dynamical groups in, in, in the Kuiper Belt. And so you can see the scale now goes, the, this plot here goes as far about 400 AU and it still does not capture uh, all the orbits. So these different uh, groups, types of orbits in the Kuiper Belt indicate the different dynamical groups and we know of at least four. And these four di different dynamical groups tell us that many different processes uh, uh, went on in the solar system. They, they, different, they provide different clues uh, to these different processes. So now, th this, in this plot, you can, you can focus on the scattered objects in green and the detached objects uh, in black. So these two groups have very large uh, elliptical orbits, but there's a difference between the two. So just focus on the green and the black orbits. Um, the scattered objects, those are in green, they have large orbits, they make, but they make close approaches to Neptune. And the, um, well, the detached objects, which are the black, uh, do not make close approaches to Neptune. So that's the difference between the two. The, the scattered Kuiper Belt object, the ones that make close approaches to Neptune, um, so over time, continued interaction with this planet make their orbits longer and longer and more elongated. And so, so that's how they get their orbits. So this group is believed to be the source of the short period comets. Uh, the other uh, group, the detached object, don't make close approaches to Neptune. And so it's not clear, we don't know why uh, they, they, they got the, the funny uh, orbits that they do, that have now. Uh, theories that have been proposed are uh, perturbation from a closely pass, passing stars, perturbation from an undetected um, massive planet, and maybe perturbations from planetary migration. In other words, we don't really know. 
but apparently there were strong gravitational events in the past uh, to give the detached objects um, these orbits. So this is the same figure, but zoomed in to, to show you the, the, the smaller orbits. Um, so, the, and you can see the concentric circles in the middle that indicating the, the, the orbits of, of the planets. So the smaller orbits include the classical objects, these are the red orbits, and the resonant objects in blue. The classical objects have nearly circular orbits, and the, these have kept them relatively far away from, ne from Neptune, so we believe they form where they are now. Um, they are seen as the, the least disturbed, the most primordial of the Kuiper Belt objects. And in, interestingly, all their orbits are clustered inside 50 AU, so there's a sharp edge of 50 AU for these guys. Um, the origin of this edge of 50 AU is unclear, uh, but people have suggested maybe it's due to a, a, a passing star within 100 AU. And finally, the, the, the resonance objects that I mentioned earlier, these are the, the, the blue orbits. Um, these objects provide strong evidence for, uh, uh, for a process called planetary migration, and Dave will talk about this in more detail. In the planetary migration picture, most of the giant planets did not form where they are now. They were somewhere else. Either their orbits, in some cases, their orbits uh, 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 shrank, got smaller. In other cases, their orbits expanded, like in the case of Neptune. So as no, uh, Neptune, Neptune expanded its orbit, it swept out into the uh, uh, Kuiper belt and captured these resonant objects, and Dave will discuss this more. Um, the resonances have complex dynamics and that's still uh, being studied. So um, to summarize, our discovery of the Kuiper belt was not due to any theory, but it was due to our uneasiness with the apparent emptiness of the outer solar system. Um, since its discovery 20 years ago, the Kuiper belt has, discovered, has yielded many surprises that dramatically changed our view of the solar system. It went from uh, being an orderly, fairly well understood place to, um, to a much more complex and badly understood place. But um, that, that just progress. Old ideas have been discarded and they have been replaced with, with new questions, very hard questions, but they challenge us and they motivate us. So in, in short, the solar system has not been so exciting for a long time. That's it. <laughs>